think I've seen about 150 documentaries on the conflict, and this is the first one that made me feel good at the end. <laughs> uh, and it comes, Salam Fayyad, on an incredibly historic day, um, a day about which you've had many thoughts, maybe some ambivalence, uh, and it's a complicated event. A state has been given credit in the United Nations in an unprecedented way, and they're celebrating today in Ramallah, they're celebrating uh, throughout Palestine. What about tomorrow morning? Uh, in terms of the state. What, what has been achieved? What hasn't been achieved? What does this do? What does it not do? Does it place you in peril? Does it place you in an, a more optimistic position? Well, thank you very much, David. And I first would like to thank the audience for the interest they have showed in coming to this movie, see it, and certainly would like to join you at the outset in thanking uh, participant media, uh, Dan Sutton, uh, Yoram Melo and Hanna Wusada, as well as others, this small crew actually who did this movie over, I don't know how long uh, a period of time it took them, but in any event, happy to be with you and the audience. And thank also Martin Mendek, my friend, who actually uh, decided to do this <coughs> at the margins of the Saban Forum for this year. Yes, it is a day of uh, a great deal of significance, indeed historic significance. And it also happens to be uh, precisely to the day, 65 years ago, that the same General Assembly uh, that today passed with a substantial majority, more than two-thirds majority, the motion uh, submitted to elevate Palestine's uh, standing to uh, a non-member state, uh, observer state of the United Nations. 65 years ago, passed the famous partition resolution, uh, 29th of November, uh, 1947, which provided for the creation of two states. One has been in existence for about that length of time, because actually some six months after that historic uh, resolution of the General Assembly, the State of Israel was created 15th of May, 1948, and here we are. 65 years later, still looking for ours. So there is that, definitely uh, parallel, and in, in, uh, in, in that's what really adds to the significance of the moment. And that actually is part of the power of the movie we just saw. Uh, it's a movie that is largely uh, about Palestinians' quest for being able to live in freedom and dignity in a country of our own. Uh, it's about us, really, but it's a movie that started, uh, actually rightly, in a way, in a, in a, in a manner that really made a great deal of sense, uh, with that historic vote that was taken uh, 15th of May 1948, that essentially gave Israel uh, its birth certificate. So there is that parallel, and the movie actually captured it uh, in, in a very good way. So yes, it has all of these meeting, me, uh, meanings. Uh, but of course, while extremely significant, we cannot but worry about the reality of the day after. And what I really hope in response to your question is that this moment is actually seized in order to advance the process in a way that has eluded us uh, for a very long period of time. And by us, I mean Palestinians, Israelis, our friends, international community, United States, European Union, Russia, United Nations, all powers to be for so long. The reality, uh, the day after, obviously, is going to be dominated as it, it is today, as it was on the day before, dominated by the reality of an oppressive occupation that has been with us for more than 45 years. That's not going to go away unless something else happens. What happened today is extremely significant. It's a step of great deal of symbolism, and it moved us all Palestinians throughout the world. People felt great about it, not only Ramallah, but as you pointed out throughout, Palestine diaspora is not a Palestinian uh, or freedom-loving person anywhere in the world who would not really uh, 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 actually appreciate uh, how uh, deep and significant uh, a moment this is. But of course, it's really up to us uh, to really move things to the next uh, step, I mean, uh, next step, and to really move on 
to ensure that we really actually get the real thing. What, what our people are looking for is a genuine state where they can live as free people with dignity. And that's, that's uh, incumbent over us. So, so rather than have a, a next yeah. step, do you anticipate paying a price for what occurred today at the UN, whether among the Israeli uh, leadership or the Republicans in the Senate and the House or uh, other political constituents in, in, in this uh, entire drama? It really depends on how things go. I, I was about to say, actually, uh, what is really important is to try to use this in a productive and positive way. For those who actually were skeptical about this or did not like it one bit, uh, as a matter of fact, well, it's behind us now. It happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think we really need to be level-headed about this. It's very significant. It is of great deal of significance. But I don't think we really should spend too much time admiring the creation if we liked it or sulking if we didn't. I mean, what we must all do is to see how we can seize the moment, take advantage of what has happened, and see if this would not uh, provide uh, an impetus to a new, strengthened, more credible political process, one that is capable of delivering, delivering an end to the Israeli occupation. You're the last person yeah. I have to spell out the, yeah. all the forces mitigating against that happening, yeah. whether it's the division between Hamas and, 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 and the political forces in the West Bank, whether it's the Israeli coalition that's moving even more to the right now that Lieberman has joined Netanyahu, you have an election coming. Uh, all, all those forces you know much better than I do, but, uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they're formidable. What, what is the scenario for a, a, a path toward negotiations and, and a path toward uh, the road that you so desperately want to see uh, Palestine on? Uh, I hope. Independent of today. Yeah, I, I hope that not much more time will be spent in self denial of the kind that, I mean, at least some of which we saw in this movie. But we also listen to some serious voices of reason in this movie on the Israeli side or projecting the Israeli point of view, saying how bad it would be uh, if, in fact, this opportunity is missed and how terrible it would be for Israel, for the Palestinians, for the region, for the international community, for the cause of peace and justice in the region. I hope that you know more uh, will begin to see things this way, uh, and the sooner the better. Because, uh, like many others, I mean, I feel that with, with each passing day, that our people, people in the region generally, continue to see the horizon on this political process, on the prospect of peace, with stability receding. Uh, I believe that's uh, something that is quite dangerous. And if it really is allowed to continue, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, there will be a lot more skepticism, and people will begin to uh, invest out, if you will, and opt out of investing uh, uh, into the prospects of the delivering. And then uh, what happens is something that uh, uh, I believe uh, would be terrible for all, all what, parties concerned. What's the best thing Barack Obama can do? What, what is the most um, effective thing he could do at this point politically to affect this process in the most positive way possible? I think first and foremost to try to, uh, in a very efficient manner, uh, take stock of the experience over the past uh, four years. And in some important ways, uh, those four years provide an example of things that really should be avoided. Uh, uh, because, you know, the past four years have not been productive, I mean, uh, to say the very least. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I believe it's high time for the administration to lead working with others in the international community, mainly the European Union. Uh, uh, get together uh, as quickly as possible and, and have some uh, serious discussion uh, as to whether or not things uh, should be allowed to continue to proceed in the way they have been proceeding. Uh, actually, not only over the past four years, but generally for much of the past 20 years or so. I think it's really about time to uh, lay out expectations uh, in terms of what a fair resolution and settlement to this conflict uh, might look like. Uh, and you'll find that actually a lot of these issues, those issues have been visited before. Uh, I think with uh, some determination and uh, 
as a matter of fact, trying to place things within a framework that has a certain timeline to it, began to really establish uh, rules of the game, new ground rules where the account accountability bar, bar is set a, li a little bit higher than before. Both sides need the leadership and involvement of the United States, and both are and should be expected, actually, to be accountable in the sense what, of... But what should that leadership do in, in concrete terms? Lay out expectations of, of the parties in terms of what's expected of both of them in order to produce that which we all want to see happen. Uh, well, uh, a lot of those things are spelled out in the document that Senator Mitchell, who appeared in this movie, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, has something to do with the so-called roadmap to peace. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Marwan Mashir is here. He uh, I have uh, a lot of an intimate knowledge of, of, of what the contents of the, that roadmap were. But actually, uh, they made sense relative to uh, the overall goal of, of that process. We Palestinians were supposed to actually improve uh, governance. We uh, had to actually essentially demonstrate that we are capable of governing ourselves in an effective way in all spheres of governance, uh, beginning with security, but not only limited to the sphere of security, financial, economic management, rule of law, and what have you. On the Israeli side, there were also expectations. Uh, a lot was said and continues to be said about settlement activity. That's key among those obligations and requirements, but it's not the only one. One of the, one of the actual problems over the past four years is why legitimate focus on settlement activity to the exclusion of other issues, actually, in some way, stood in the way of making progress on other issues. Uh, military incursions, so for that, example. So that was an American mistake, just focus on settlement activity? I believe the focus should be on all of the requirements, mm -hmm. uh, and not only on settlement activity needing to come to a stop. Uh, that was recognized as something that was important, part of getting uh, ready or, or, or paving the way uh, toward lasting peace and, and security in the region. But it was not the only requirement. There were other requirements that were completely ignored. And worse, there were some issues that were ignored, as a matter of fact, at the risk of, uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, allowing for the possibility of things sliding back in the direction of vicious cycle of violence. For example, uh, the violent manner in which the Israeli army deals with nonviolent Palestinian demonstrators and demonstrations. I mean, this is both wrong and can be potentially extremely dangerous. I mean, you can easily get to a point where it, it has been or has become an incident too many. Settler violence, you saw some elements, I mean, uh, features of that here. Those issues did not really get the kind of attention they should have gotten over the past four years, and I believe they must. Mr. Prime Minister, I, I don't mean to be a film critic here, but yeah. I, I started out by saying this seemed to me a profoundly optimistic film. But maybe only on the surface, because it seemed to me that all the players in the film yeah. uh, were at once incredibly constructive. You, uh, the, the man who lost his son to Hamas and, and is yet fighting uh, for, for peace. The, the young woman who's at Hebrew University who's um, going to demonstration at Sheikh Jarrah and, and, and all the rest. But it seems to me all of these constituencies are less than they used to be. These liberal Zionists who are demonstrating, the Amos Ozes who are out in front of the Tel Aviv uh, uh, City Hall. And quite frankly, sir, w w with all the admiration in the room for you, you yourself, who have a constituency here and in the international community, but at home, you're a highly controversial figure. And while prime minister, it's, it's hard always to see what your following is on the street, as they say. Uh, forget about Gaza. but in the West Bank itself. How do you assess your own position at home? Uh, uh, <laughs> before I get into that, things are not nearly as bad. <laughs> For one thing, uh, it's Huck Frank Frankenthal actually still able, or was still able toward the end of the movie, to light his pipe with one hand while driving with the other. That, uh, that's uh, an undeniable I, I, skill. I, I, I thought that was really <laughs> remarkable. So, <laughs> Don't try that at home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was a powerful scene, by the way. Uh, not about the pipelines, but, uh, about the pipes. But in any event, no, uh, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think uh, 
you know, beginning actually with the period or, or the point in time when, when the Palestinian authorities started to have difficulty making ends meet, especially, especially. Uh, the PA, uh, its overall standing started to erode. Uh, we've been having uh, serious financial difficulties for more than two and a half years right now. Uh, that was uh, certainly a complicating factor that led to an erosion the standing Palestinian Authority uh, and was compounded, obviously, by a lack of effectiveness, as it was seen by the public, on the part of the Palestinian Authority in delivering tangible results politically. We were seen and continue to be seen as a party to a political process that, to say the least, has not been very productive. Right. If anything, uh, it has led to and has been about a lot of disappointment, uh, if not our outright disillusionment. So, yeah, you tend to lose uh, a lot of uh, whatever capital you may have had at some point uh, if you're confronted with a situation like this. Uh, Despite all the building that we saw, despite yeah, all the construction yeah. work that we Well, did. you know, people in Palestine, people uh, are like people in this country. What have you done for me lately? I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're normal, uh, at least in that sense. So, so there is that, uh, obviously. Uh, and, and that's really a challenge of being government. I mean, but, you but really have to earn your colors every day. And it's a tough thing to do if you're operating in the context of a highly oppressive occupation uh, without much to really, uh, that much, uh, to really support your effort in, uh, in terms of really bringing about better living conditions and, and all of that. How do you assess what happened in Gaza, uh, in the conflict between Israel and, and, and Gaza and the Palestinians a couple of weeks ago? It was e extraordinary to me that at, in, in the wake of it, everybody came out declaring victory. Bibi Netanyahu won, uh, Hamas won, uh, Egypt won, the United States won. And meanwhile, 150 people were dead, and there were a lot of uh, <laughs> enormous fear and, and, and backward movement, to say the least. How could anybody have won that? I hope people would stop thinking uh, of what happened in Gaza along the same lines. There'd be many wars if, if everybody emerges as winner. Uh, well, to, to a large extent, this was predictable. I mean, claim of victory by as many parties as you have mentioned, uh, in some ways, was Predictable. Except for Mahmoud Abbas, who was declared uh, the opposite. Uh, well, uh, we in the PA generally, yeah. as a matter of fact, uh, and I can tell you, it contributed to what I describe and consider to be a doctrinal defeat for what we stand for. There's no question about it. There's, there's no question about it. We stand for what you have heard me say. Uh, we stand for a nonviolent path to freedom. And we have not been able to deliver. It was Hamas that was able to secure the release of more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. It was Hamas uh, pushing a few buttons that was able to get this much attention over a very short period of time. This is the fundamental sense in which I can very truthfully tell you that what we have sustained is a doctrinal defeat. It's, it's very serious. Uh, I do not really say this from the point of view of someone who's resigned to the fact that this is something that we cannot recover from. I think it's absolutely important for us to recover from it. Mm -hmm. But we have to be honest uh, with ourselves and really call it for what it is. Uh, Palestinian Authority that stands for a nonviolent path to freedom, stands for building strong, competent institutions of government capable of delivering services in a highly responsive and responsible manner to the people, uh, stands for what good government is about, what should be. Uh, building toward a state that's based on foundational principles that are uni universally shared, I, mean, I think should, should really have a, 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 a better chance, should have more to work with than it has been having to work with, to be honest with you. And this requires uh, much better management of the political process on the one hand, and you know, I cannot really uh, overemphasize the importance of this particular point, because we just can't keep going uh, uh, operating under the notion that we need to deepen our readiness for state. So there's so much you can do, as Jeremy Ben-Ami had to say on the movie. You really need to begin to really see these two paths converge, uh, building to a state on the, one, on the one hand, but also you know, delivering uh, political results, beginning to see the occupation regime uh, in, in process of being uh, dismantled. Uh, however, gradually, but what our people have been actually looking at, 
uh, is an occupation regime that will each passing day become more deep, deeply entrenched. It's no surprise, therefore, that the PA would find itself in the position it finds itself today. Do you have any common language at this point? Do you have anything to say to Hamas in, in, in a, or is this just a, a, a complete uh, conflictual uh, relationship? Um, no, there is, uh, and there must be, yeah, I tell you, because, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, as part of being ready for statehood, I believe it's very important for us to be able to reunify our country and the institutions of our people. Uh, I think uh, continuing to be separated the way we have been since uh, mid-2007 is a serious risk to the continued viability of two-state solution. Without reunification, without Gaza, I don't think a two-state solution will be viable. Uh, we believe in a path of negotiated settlement uh, to peace and clearly support for a two-state solution in Israel uh, is based on what we have said, several uh, proponents of the uh, solution, like Tsipilimni, for example, uh, how she was presenting the case. If Gaza continues to drift away in the direction of becoming a standalone entity or, 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 or more, well, that takes out some 1.6, 1.7 million Palestinians out of the demographic equation, uh, as you heard it said on the movie as well. Uh, so much for the appeal of two-state solution in Israel. From our point of view, in addition to all of that, it's absolutely important for us to be able to reunify the country. So there is common language, in fact, and there is that which is absolutely essential in order for us to be able to take off. And that is, that is, that is, to, be, to define it uh, with precision, uh, agreement to a uh, security doctrine uh, along the lines that uh, uh, you have heard me uh, uh, explain. I want to give a chance to the audience to ask some questions. I'm going to ask one last question, one last question. And please, when you do ask a question, let it be a question, not a statement, a speech, a declaration. We take advice, too. Absolutely. Uh, a little bit. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, uh, a, a very general question, uh, but uh, I hope you can answer it with specifics. Yeah. How have the dynamics of the uh, Arab Spring helped or hurt you uh, in your quest? Now that, it, now that it's t taken a kind of uh, darker maturity in some ways. You know, in, in some way, uh, actually, it, it sort of brought into sharper focus. Uh, the need for our people to be able to live as free people because essentially the, our cause uh, is about uh, freedom, justice, uh, enfranchisement, and that's the essence of what underlay uh, the start of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, so, and you saw a lot of that, as a matter of fact. I mean, a lot of people drawing parallel between what was happening or beginning to happen mm -hmm. in streets in Arab countries and uh, absence of... Uh, that sense of enfranchisement and all in, in Palestine for as long as, uh, well, for a very long period of time. And, uh, and, and, and so therefore, early on at least, uh, it has helped. However, uh, the ensuing preoccupation within the region, but also internationally, with what was going on in the region, contributed to marginalizing our cause. Uh, and I believe so much so uh, that we uh, really were shoved off to the back burner. And we uh, paid the dear price because of that. It was not intended uh, to happen this way, but that was a consequence of the Arab Spring. Um, and it also coincided with a period when the political cycle in this country was driving up in the direction of elections, with the EU being consumed with unprecedented financial crisis, and with so much less, therefore, of the times of respective administrations of all of these countries uh, available. A lot of it really uh, was spent, and a lot of those energies directed toward looking at other countries in the region uh, at the expense of the Palestinian cause. So we, we therefore really paid the dear price because of it in, in, in that important sense. Uh, we have to recover from this uh, because uh, it, it is important. You've heard, you hear a lot of people these, uh, these days begin to say again uh, that no matter what else happens, uh, you need to really be able to solve this conflict the Palestinian-Israel conflict, uh, if you are to have uh, lasting peace and, and security in the region, and in ways that probably would validate the fundamental message of the Arab Spring. There's a gentleman in the back who's raising his hand with alarming speed. <laughs> Go ahead. 
you say, please say your name. So sure. That way My you name is Mohammed Abdullah. I'm, I'm from Syria. Congratulations on today. Say your name. Mohammed Abdullah. I'm from Syria. Okay. Congratulations on today's uh, uh, decision. What, one, one question. I want to pick up on David's question about what President Obama can do to ask, do you really believe President Obama wants to do anything or he gave up after he failed in stopping the settlements? Because I don't believe the Palestinian state has been in his priority and in, in the priorities and his schedule. And if you look at the third presidential debate between President Obama and Governor Romney, nobody mentioned the Palestinian state. They talked about Iran, Libya, Syria, everything except the Palestinian state. True and one, one final question, is Palestinian well, state let's, let's wants one, to go to the one, ICC? Sir, let's do one question, sure. if, we, if we can. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, answer to your first question was provided by a, a lady uh, who shook her head, uh, basically saying no. Uh, <laughs> look, I mean, President Obama has a lot on his plate, I mean, uh, obviously. I hope that actually his administration uh, will accord this issue the priority and the importance uh, and the attention uh, it deserves. My own sense, though, is that unless uh, there begins to be uh, some activity that is suggestive or possibility of progress, once again we lose uh, that competition to other issues. I mean, uh, I'm afraid so. I think fundamentally there, there, there must be that interest. I mean, that interest is always there on the part of all administrations and, and, and try to do something. It uh, doesn't really matter what happens during elections campaign, uh, what people say in debates, particularly in primaries. Uh, we featured some, no in some of those primaries in, in ways that a lot of people would soon, uh, soon forget about, <laughs> for one. But in any event, uh, I, I hope there'll be some uh, uh, attention given to this uh, early on, uh, again, taking advantage of the experience of the past uh, four years. I mean, the issues really need to be approached a lot more seriously. Questions need to really begin to be put forward uh, in a straightforward way. Uh, uh, what is our problem with settlement activity? Oh, I see General Rami now. Uh, I didn't before. Hi. But, I mean, he said it in Bube. But beyond that, beyond that, it, it's, it's actually uh, that diminishing sense of assurance that at some day we're going to really be able to have a state so long as that activity continues. It's the credibility of the political process. It, it's, I mean, that's the political side uh, of the damage associated with continuing construction in our territory and expansion. That's, that's what that. Fundamentally, I think the problem today, as I see it, is that there is a wide gap between that which the government of Israel is prepared to offer, and that which we Palestinians are minimally prepared to accept. What we really need, first and foremost, or is for a straightforward question to be put forward to the government of Israel. It's a very simple question. Do you accept as a solution of this conflict the emergence of a fully sovereign state of Palestine on the territory occupied in 1967? Yes or no? Yes or no? I mean, that's what we really need. We do not have that assurance today. We did not have over the past years. We have not had for a long period of time. That's what's really missing. And that, I believe, fundamentally, is, is what we would like to see the administration do, first and foremost. Really get down to it and really uh, ask these fundamental questions. Because uh, what you really have, uh, well, I can tell you something. Some of you, at least, may have noticed. Uh, most recent primaries in Israel. There was uh, an ad in the Jerusalem Post. And uh, it was labeled something like accountability time. And the ad ran something like this. Uh, it, it basically was. An ad for whom? Um, well, uh, the point of it was these are the people who have opposed State of Palestine, meaning these are the people who are against two state solutions, uh, essentially promoting the candidates taking pride in the fact that they have opposed and they've been opposing to a set solution. I mean, that's, that's actually part of the, I mean, the leader of the current coalition government, that's Likud party. The, these were the Likud primaries. So there's fundamentally a lot that is wrong with the current alignment. Uh, and that is why 
I think it's very important to early on begin to put forward these questions. And I think it's important not to wait until after the Israeli elections. I think it's important to begin to put those questions forward now. We had a question up here, uh, up, up top, and then we'll go lower. In the lighter shirt with a beard. I, I, I'm just That's describing me. it. So. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gaithal Omari. And I actually want to kind of continue on this uh, theme. Because what I've heard from you, Dr. Salam, and what I've been hearing a lot is the need for a political horizon, the need for assurances. Frankly, my assessment with the current set of characters and current dynamics, we will not have the end game. We will not have peace anytime soon until things stabilize. And I doubt that we're going to get any clear assurances. So short of the big one, short of the kind of big, clear political horizon, what can we do to stabilize the situation and to keep things alive? And I'm particularly building on what you said earlier about the need for at least some gradual steps to show the Palestinians that the Israelis are serious about uh, moving forward. What kind of steps are these? What can we look for in the medium term, short term, to ensure there is stability and at least, if not full peace, then lack of collapse? Thank you, Rev. Good to see you. <laughs> Let me first say, on, on the question of assurances, it would be good if we really can get those directly. But we'll be equally satisfied if those assurances are given to a uh, an adequately assuring degree to the Americans. I mean, if the United States presidents were to come to us and say, I'm fairly assured based on conversation I've had with the Israeli prime minister, that we'll be able to uh, have the kind of deal that we're able to live with, that's good enough for, from our point of view. We approach it this way, uh, for, for certain. But beyond uh, that, which I think is essential, if we're really going to begin to see some activity that could promise beginning of an end to the Israeli occupation, which I think is absolutely essential. First and foremost, uh, the PA needs to be stabilized. I mean, we've been losing ground for much of the past two years because we have been running on an empty tank of gas, basically. Uh, not mainly, but only because we've been getting less assistance, less aid uh, than pledged or, or than promised. And with that, you obviously cannot meet obligations in timely fashion. That chips away at your credibility, which already actually is damaged uh, or undermined by lack of progress on that political front. So things kind of uh, are reinforcing each other in a negative and adverse way. That is very, very important. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, those other issues I quickly mentioned, uh, like, for example, paying attention to the need to begin to see some change behavior on the part of the Israeli army. It's absolutely important. There's no justification for dealing with nonviolent demonstrations in a violent way. That's both wrong and dangerous. Settler violence is something that really actually needs to be reined in. And it has been detrimental not only to Palestinians, but to Israelis as well. You, you've described what your bottom line is yeah. in terms of the 67, 67 more or less 67 yes. borders. The bottom line for Middle Israel, as it were, which in, in its great majority is, is, is for a settlement, for a peace settlement, at least in the abstract, their, their bottom line is, what do we get the next day? We still have a, a, a Hamas-led uh, Gaza, which looks extremely aggressive, in no way democratic. Uh, and likely, quite possibly, to continue being aggressive in, in, in the aftermath. How do you answer that question to Israelis insofar as you want to? Um, I think uh, it's very important uh, for there to be collaborative effort on the part of all involved and concerned uh, to ensure uh, in the aftermath of what happened in Gaza that the PA uh, would be having a, a, an important role to play uh, in arrangements that may be agreed, particularly regarding geography and, and passages, uh, is very important. Um, so we begin to really uh, deal with those issues. Because uh, for one thing, what the situation uh, has been like, and, and I, I think that's something that I believe Israel would be very much interested in changing. Uh, is a situation where uh, you have a, a non-state operator acting out of Gaza uh, with the logic of the non-state operator to the extent that that non-state operator can begin to act more like a state operator that's, that works toward overall stability. But it's really best, in my view, to ensure that that convergence or evolution would take place within the framework of Palestinian Authority. 
That's absolutely important. Uh, that's, that's how you really begin to deal with, with these issues. But then um, uh, also the other thing I would say, it's of paramount importance for Israel not to really continue to wait until the perfect arrangement emerges. Uh, it is of great deal of importance you know, for us Palestinians to be able to reunite our country uh, and the institutions of our people uh, in order for there to be the possibility uh, of, of a Palestinian state. So we really need to be able to find a way you know, toward that. Uh, there are many conditions that have been attached to that, and I think it's really time to really begin to focus on that which is absolutely necessary in order for an arrangement between us and Hamas to be viable. Uh, and I think it would be uh, of great deal of importance to uh, really see to it that such arrangement uh, is found on the basis of an adequate secret doctrine. Uh, it is going to be the case that Hamas would have a, a political platform that's different from ours. Is that enough to stop the effort to put the country back together, the institutions back together? I don't think so. But is lack of adequate security doctrine uh, enough to, uh, or, or, or would lack of adequate security doctrine be okay to have and still entertain the notion of putting the country back together and, and uh, to reconcile? I'd say no. Uh, what is really absolutely important is for us to ensure that security arrangements are adequate and that there is a secret doctrine that's consistent very much with what we stand for, path of nonviolence to freedom. If that is there, uh, I think that would be the minimum uh, required in order for us to be able to take off. If it isn't, then it will be a case of too many, too many missing ingredients. But to continue to really have a long list of conditions before it's okay for us Palestinians to reconcile is not in anyone's interest, including Israel, I should say. This gentleman here. Uh, Ted Katouf, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, since uh, the death of Faisal Hosseini, uh, Jerusalem, the Arabs, the Palestinians in Jerusalem seem, forgive me, but somewhat leaderless. It seems that we have the PA operating in the West Bank, we have Hamas in Gaza, but in East Jerusalem and the Arab neighborhoods, there doesn't seem to be a lot of political organization, um, despite the house takeovers and the like. We've seen Arab cities erupt when put under enough pressure, but Jerusalem remains quiet. Well, how do you see the situation uh, in East Jerusalem, and what is the relationship that you see that you have with the people there? Uh, as you know, the PA is precluded from uh, being active uh, in a formal way in East Jerusalem. Uh, nevertheless, we, we, we try, and uh, been trying the best we, we can, uh, and not always the right way, uh, as a matter of fact. In recent years, we shifted attention more in the direction of empowering Palestinian institutions in East Jerusalem uh, to support them so they can actually, in turn, provide the services needed uh, for our people there. That has proven to be a lot more effective than before. Uh, in education, uh, health, and what have you. We would like to be able to do more and, and, and better there, but again, uh, depth of resources has been uh, a serious limiting factor. Nevertheless, uh, I believe it's absolutely essential to continue to move forward along those lines, uh, empowering Palestinian institutions. And by the way, when we were really talking about the, the roadmap, one of the conditions or obligations uh, that the government of Israel accepted, going back to Spring 2003 was to allow Palestinian institutions in East Jerusalem those clues to reopen. Uh, not only have they not been reopened or allowed to be open, actually every six months the government of Israel passes a resolution to keep them closed. Right. See, this is again, you know, settlement activity is important. We really need to continue to focus on it. But there are all of these other issues uh, which are important, and progress on at least some of them uh, uh, would make a positive contribution. I think we have time for two more uh, here and there. Let's go here and then we'll go there. Sorry about that. You can just shout. 
Okay. Yeah, well, um, good evening, Mr. Prime Minister, and uh, I want to first uh, congratulate you. My name is Uri Zaki. I'm uh, from Israel. I, I live here now. Uh, and I think I speak in, 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 uh, in the name of many Israelis who uh, felt uh, thrilled today by uh, the vote. And I also want to congratulate you for your successes uh, in Palestine in, in the institution building. But now after the congratulations, I want to ask you a tough question. What would you say about the argument that your success uh, and the mere existence of the PA after so many years after the uh, interim agreement ended makes the Israeli occupation more sustainable by being a deluxe occupation where you don't have to manage the population but only the uh, a territory? Deluxe occupation, did you say? Uh, deluxe. 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 deluxe five yeah. star. Five star occupation, five star. yeah. Four seasons of occupations, yeah. I see. Yeah. Not to endorse any hotel, but. <laughs> <laughs> there is, uh, you know, there is that risk. Uh, and actually, uh, significant number of people early on uh, thought that this is what our program was about. Uh, they were skeptics. Uh, but the passage of time and messaging uh, on the content of what uh, we were trying to do, uh, that gave way to more credibility. Uh, on behalf of that which, uh, which we're trying to accomplish. Uh, interestingly, actually, if you uh, objectively observe developments and monitor them, I think we are on, on the downside now, uh, with more people beginning to buy into the notion that this is really about adapting to the reality of prolonged occupation, not about securing freedom for our people. I mean, there is, there is definitely that risk. But I would not personally uh, uh, recommend that uh, people invest in this notion too much. Right? Let me tell you why. I mean, you can make all Palestinians millionaires. I don't know if, if this is uh, possible, but uh, assume it is. You can make them all millionaires. You're not going to solve the problem. Because this conflict, at its core, is a political conflict that requires political resolution. And conversely, just because people are not really making it doesn't really mean uh, you know, that that's all that they're going to be looking for is improving their living conditions. This occupation cannot but end because it's oppressive to us and oppressive and corrosive to the Israelis. You, you see, uh, even if, from Israel's point of view, the past four or five years have been OK in, in the sense of security having become better without them having to worry about it, they went through an elections campaign without really having to address the issue. And there is risk that they might go through another elections campaign without getting to this issue unless Someone early on starts putting things before the Israeli electorate and public in general, people of the region in general, this country. And, and I think that's important. Um, although the four, past four or five years have been like that, I, I think it's wrong to really be too sanguine about sustainability of the uh, status quo. Uh, there's a great deal of risk. Not to mention that even if you know, things were and can be presumed to continue to proceed in the way or along the lines they have been proceeding over the past four or five years. I mean, I do not believe, and you saw some samples of Israeli public opinion, uh, occupation is corrosive to Israel. And it's, it's just not going to really continue. It's oppressive to us, corrosive to them, it cannot but end. So I'm not too, too worried about this. I mean, a lot of our detractors certainly have invested in this theory to attack us, to undermine or to cast doubt on the credibility of that which we're doing, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, unfortunately, the way things turned out, uh, that lent some credence to uh, that thinking. Uh, I beg to differ, though. <laughs> ah, the famous yeah, producer. Ah. Ah. Not long ago, I had a meeting with uh, Ron Dermer, who was, who is you know, who was in the film with the uh, consultant for Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. He told me whatever agreement that is going to take place, is gonna, it's going to have to take into consideration the demographic changes, and he's speaking about the Jewish demographic changes, that took place in the West Bank. Now, I personally think it's going to be very, 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 very difficult to remove this amount of close to 400, 500 settlers on the West Bank. Is there anything that you can 
share with us about your thinking outside of the box, some kind of creative uh, solution to where we stand now? Well, uh, you know, for one thing, uh, I, I hope uh, enough people in Israel get to see the movie you produced. Uh, what we really need is uh, more activity that is aimed at uh, producing uh, more transformation. Uh, I think there is not, there has not been real readiness, uh, and the conditions have not been ripe enough for a solution. There's a, I think to this day, majority, if you push people a little bit, not too hard, in favor, who still would find that this is the, the most sensible solution concept. But I think given the failures, I mean, they'd be right uh, not to think that uh, it's inevitable. I mean, things could really continue to drag along in a way that actually would produce eternal conflict or a conflict for a very long period of time uh, in ways that are not really good. What we really need uh, are more instruments that are capable of uh, producing the transformation transformation that's necessary. More people from the realm of uh, not only accepting the notion of two-state solu solution, but actually believing that it can happen uh, and beginning to really view it as inevitable. When you really get to that point, that's when we will have succeeded. And so uh, I think we really need uh, to engage in activity of the kind that we're engaging in tonight. Uh, your, your, your question is specifically yeah. about settlement removal, isn't it? Yeah, my question is, uh, I'll, I'll be very blunt and uh, say, would you accept all these Jewish settlements that do not want to go back to the Green Line to stay? Um, let me tell you, uh, as a matter of fact, with settlement activity having uh, continued for as long as it has, and settler population having uh, increased so substantially, uh, I mean, one cannot really but wonder, and a lot of those who wonder about the continued viability of the two-state solution, base it on that, given that enormous increase in settler population and the extent to which it's practical to continue to think in terms of annexing uh, settlements to the state of Israel. Uh, no, I, I, I don't believe that's really the only way uh, one uh, can look at uh, possible solutions to this issue, uh, I don't think. And I can tell you for certain uh, that the state of Palestine is one that is going to be based on uh, a legal framework that uh, 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 actually uh, ensures equality and non-discrimination, uh, regardless of uh, one's background, uh, ethnic background, religious background, what have you. Uh, so uh, let me tell you, it may be as a matter of fact that as soon as or once the notion of land swap started to creep into the lexicon, that may have actually con contributed to the problem having gotten as, as, as big as it has become. Uh, there is no issue you know, for someone who lives in Israel to really move to the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, thinking that, uh, well, this is going to be a part of Israel forever. Uh, if other possibilities begin to be considered, uh, that calculus may change. Uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, as far as we Palestinians are concerned, what is absolutely important for us is uh, to have territorial integrity for that state of Palestine, and that means a state on the territory occupied in 1967. Gaza, West Bank, including East Jerusalem. That's what's really important to us. Uh, some settlers wish to stay uh, in the state of Palestine. Uh, that's fine, and, and their rights will be fully protected uh, and constitutionally protected. Uh, and like any country, that's actually respectful of the rights of everyone. Uh, that's how I look at it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Thank you.